Hi, everyone, and welcome to Reporters here on France 24. In this edition, we take you to Iceland, a country known for its glaciers and stunning views of the Northern Lights. But it's not just its impressive landscapes that sets the island nation apart. Its politics also make it unique. Iceland has the oldest parliament in Europe, and for more than a decade, the country has topped the World Economic Forum's report on gender equality. Women make up about 48 percent of the nation's lawmakers, making Iceland's parliament the most balanced in terms of gender in all of Europe. Melina Uet takes a closer look at whether the nation lives up to its reputation as a model for gender equality. This island of barely 380,000 inhabitants granted women the right to vote in 1915. Then, over 40 years ago, they became the first country in the world to elect a female head of state. Je le fais pour nos filles. Iceland has a law governing equal pay and generous parental leave. I would love to be a stay-at-home dad. In 1975, a feminist strike paralyzed the country. The world stops if women stop. This is a nation that champions gender equality. But where nothing can be taken for granted. We need to step up a lot. Is Iceland really such a paradigm for gender equality? In Iceland, gender equality is taught from preschool. In the 1980s, Margaret Olafdottir invented a method that was pioneered worldwide. The Shatli model. Shatli means to break taboos. The idea was born out of an observation she made after years of teaching in kindergarten and primary school. Somehow, the boys, they, t they tended to take more space than they were expected to. And too often I saw the girls step back. There was something they were not quite sure about and so on. And I had this feeling, what is going on? So it was like a split of a second. I understood, oh my God, there is nothing wrong with my girls, even though they're stepping back. There is nothing wrong with the boys, even though they're sometimes taking more space than, than I would have liked. The frame is wrong. Margaret decided to create a new type of school where she invited pupils to slip out of this so-called frame. Here, boys and girls are separated for part of the day. All activities that are usually assigned to one group or the other are practiced indiscriminately. Football is not only played by boys, and it's not only the girls who are taught to look after the needs of themselves and others. Okay. Okay. Jensina is the head teacher of this school, one of 17 found across the country. When she found out that girls were staying in one corner of the playground with the boys taking up the rest of the space, she decided to divide it into two equal areas separated by a simple path. The boys came out and they felt like we had taken the area away from them. And the girls, their experience was that they came out and asked, can we go there? Can we go there? They were asking for permission to use the area. So we teach the boys to be fair. Meanwhile, we are giving the girls opportunities to just 
take the area. It's all yours. The children are mixed again at the end of the day and have no difficulty playing together. While this Shatli method was questioned in its early days, Margaret was recognized by the Icelandic government in 2007 for her educational innovation as well as for her successful academic results. We are probably the only schools and nurseries in Iceland having researches to back up what we are saying. We are seeing that our children later on, they are more broad-minded when it comes to what is meant for men or women. Our children are doing better in all subjects. From children with open minds and less gender bias to mothers for whom having children no longer obstructs their careers. We're now heading for Selfoss, one hour from the capital Reykjavik, to meet a family with four children. I am cooking uh, homemade super healthy pancakes for the kids. It's like as soon as he figures out that I am cooking this, you're gonna start hearing some noises. While David cooks, his partner Astros is juggling family life, running an online business and her political commitments. All of it shared on her social media. I've been pregnant pretty much non-stop since December 2017. That's never stopped me from doing the things that are important to me, like running in local elections. As soon as her youngest was born, Astros and David split their parental leave so she could campaign. A non-issue for this father who relishes the opportunity to spend more time with his children. I would love to be a stay-at-home dad. The baby gets like one year that it can spend with its parents and it's divided into six months for dad, six months for mom. In 2021, parental leave increased from 10 to 12 months with six weeks transferable to either parent. I have like a couple of friends that live in the States and they really, really envious of how it's like here. And I can understand that. You're getting paid to stay at home, but what you are getting paid is not nothing close to what you're making. Allowances are 80% of the average parent's salary, up to a limit of 4,200 euros per month. A situation that would make many other Europeans envious. But attitudes in society have evolved quickly. Icelanders are now asking their leaders for even greater flexibility. We need more options for parents, you know, whether it's daycare, preschool, or staying at home and get paid. Uh, you get to decide. You, as a parent, get to decide. Astros and her centre-right party are now campaigning for three years paid leave. Politics is an area that Icelandic women have been involved in from very early on. On the 24th of October 1975, the first feminist strike was organised in the country. It was to be a social tsunami. In order to obtain more rights, 90% of women stopped working, both inside and outside their homes. As a result, the whole country came to a standstill. Sigrid Erduna was among them. She was 23 years old at the time and took part in a women's rally in the northwest of the country. Her memories of that historic day are still intact. I remember uh, very well going home after that meeting, uh, the smell of burnt meat in the streets because the husbands were trying to cook dinner. This unprecedented strike made international headlines and allowed them to swiftly pass a raft of new legislation. The right to termination of a pregnancy, which had not been in effect before, and attention had been drawn to the importance of, uh, of uh, childcare. So what were women to do if they were to work outside the home? You know, they needed kindergartens and so on. After the strike, this anthropology professor co-founded the Women's List, Iceland's first feminist party. In 1983, she became a Women's List MP, again attracting worldwide attention. We were three that were elected into Parliament, Kristin, Guðrún and I. There is this from Posten in Denmark, which says, Icelandic women have made a miracle. Nowhere had a women's party based on feminist ideas, nowhere 
had they succeeded. If they had tried to institute it, it didn't succeed. It was only in Iceland. Sigrida explains this success through the country's history. 150 years of women running the home while their husbands went out to sea to fish. She says it was also due to the island's relatively small population. You probably are related to, or were in school with, or have friends who are part of the feminist movement, which makes it less foreign. It makes it less, it makes it closer to you. The last major breakthrough was in 2018 when a law imposed equal pay. Since then, it's no longer up to female employees to prove that they're being discriminated against, but to employers to prove they're not discriminating against them. A pioneering model that has allowed Iceland to lead the world report on gender equality for the past 12 years. According to the professor, it's no cause for celebration. To be top of that list is not to be very high, really, because the comparison is so bad. Yes, we have achieved a lot, but it's one thing to have legislation passed and another thing to implement it. We still have a way to go, but we are on the path, I think, to the future of possibly gender equality. Even in Iceland, life isn't perfect. 22% of women say they suffer or have suffered from domestic violence in the country. Sometimes I am asked, how can you explain that in this e equality paradise that Iceland is, that uh, gender-based violence still exists? And probably uh, the answer to that is that it isn't a, a gender equality paradise. Sigfrida is the director of a shelter for women fleeing violence. Founded in 1982, it's one of the oldest in Europe. We have, I think, quite good laws on restraining water. It's simple, it says, basically how you, can, how you can use them, but still they are not being used. I think that is the greatest problem with, with the laws in Iceland. Hi, Sonia. Hey. How are you? Nice to meet you again. Nice to meet you too. It's been a while. Yeah, September. It's September. Yeah. It Sonia been? is a survivor who passed through the shelter with her two children. Yeah. Currently, survivors can live here for up to a year. Yeah. You want me to show you the apartment? Yes, please. Go. Yeah. I'll show you. The rent for these flats is two times below the market average. While Sonia was able to stay for free at the time, her stay was limited to only a few weeks. A break that changed everything for her. It really saved my life. It cuts the ties with the abuser. Her husband inflicted 18 years of psychological and physical abuse on her. Abuse treated too lightly by the courts, she says. My ex-husband got nine months, but only had to stay in prison for three months. I think that if he would have been a stranger and would have attacked me on the streets, as he did in our home, he probably would get a sentence like attempted murder or something like that. Because the beating was so severe, uh, not only with his hands and feet, he he, he beat me, me with a bottle, a glass bottle, and um, threatened to throw me off the balcony. And then he threw me out. So for me, this is attempted murder, nothing else. Sonia feels lucky to have been able to benefit from a groundbreaking policy. The police can now step inside the home and they have the, this 24 hour window to separate the, the people, the partners, and um, guide the, the victim. Within what's called the 24-hour window, investigators trained in gender-based violence, but also social workers and child protection officers must visit the home. The aim is to prevent an abuser from luring the victim back into his grip and shut that possibility down for good. This measure was first introduced locally by a former lawyer who joined the police. Two years ago, Sigrid Bjork was appointed head of the National Police Force. We have seven uh, reports a day on rape or, or domestic violence. It's about 
increase for the first three months of this year. Bad figures that she says are paradoxically due to the success of awareness campaigns over the past 10 years. She's pushing for all complaints to lead to a trial and for women to be accompanied through the procedure by a person dedicated to their case. You don't have to call into an organization trying to find your case, you know, being cast from one side to another. We just try to do things differently by listening to our clients, listening to the people we are here to serve. And by listening to them, we can do things better. In June 2022, a law was passed making it easier to divorce for women who are victims of violence from a partner. If Iceland is held up as a model, this small country is still today in search of perfection. And that does it for this edition of Reporters. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.